Well, it's uh, really a pleasure to uh, to be here, and this group of people is I mean, almost everybody in this room has known each other for at least ten years, if not thirty five years, and it's really fun to be back. Um, I was told I was supposed to uh, incite uh, enthusiasm and and establish a vision for the next couple of days. And so I entitled this The Future Impact of Computers in Pediatric Critical Care. Now this uh, classic book that all of you have undoubtedly never seen before. <laughs> I actually have a copy here. <laughs> and so, so you can, uh, we can circulate it around the room. It needs to land with uh, Bob Tamburo because Bob has claimed it. And uh, he's at the NIH. He's probably the most important person in the room to be bribing. <laughs> so this was written in 1985. Uh, I left Hopkins in 1987, and like Randall said, he didn't learn how to turn on his PC until after I left in 1987. So uh, here we go. Clicker, clicker does not work. Okay, so let's go back to the old-fashioned method here. So there were a, a number of areas I could talk about. The ubiquity of computers, large data sets, artificial intelligence, and how do we envision the next steps. And I will tell you that the artificial intelligence component of this talk changed drastically on November 30th of last year. And so I reworked the talk completely. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit less about some of the other things. But I want to introduce you to my favorite program. This is called McPuff. McPuff is a computer simulation of human respiration that was written by C.J. Dickinson in 1972 and published in 1979 in this monograph. And I found this monograph when I was a chief resident at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And I was intrigued because it described all the Fortran code and described this simulation in detail. And um, I translated it into BASIC on a computer in the clinical lab at, uh, at uh, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And uh, I took that program with me to Hopkins and Randall and I played with it in BASIC on an old HP uh, that was in the, uh, the room that was previously inhabited by Halstead. And, uh, and then subsequently I put it back into a PDP 1134 and Fortran and the rest is it's been on every platform that I know of. So why is this interesting? Well, here are some classic physiologic data that all of you have not read except Randall uh, from JAP in 1973. Uh, and these are just experimental data, but this is McPuff compared to those experimental data. Very good agreement on a variety of respiratory parameters, acute decompression of humans, uh, very much maps onto that. And so my original view when I left Children's Hospital Los Angeles and went to Hopkins and then as I was embarking on my career, was that I thought there'd be a computer at every bedside and the computer would be actively connected to the specific patient that was in that bed. And that a physician could actually ask the computer what would happen if I changed the ventilator settings. And that's in the last chapter of this book, which was a science fiction view of the future. And Dr. Sam Spadius is in the book. And um, don't ask me where I came up with the name, but he asks the computer what would happen if I did X, Y, Z. Um, and eventually, I thought that ventilator manufacturers would put that kind of technology into the computer, into the ventilator, because the ventilator knows just about every aspect of lung function that we can feed it. And somehow that would work. This is not a new idea. These are the authors of McPuff. And they did exactly what I described, which is they tried to use McPuff on a DEC PDP 1134 to model patients. This is 1980, 82, and 84, and the first author is C.J. Hines. And they actually did pretty well. The upper left-hand corner is PaO2 and PCO2 predictions versus actual what happened after they changed the ventilator settings. And these are some other parameters. So I contacted Hines in 2015. This is a long history of me contacting people. I have a letter from Art Guyton uh, when I was a fellow, uh, he gave me all his physiological models and hooked me up with a whole bunch of people because I really thought simulation was going to be how we were going to use computers in the ICU. Heinz said they'd never followed up on it, and now they're all dead. Every single person that was an author of McPuff is dead. 
Now, where are we? We do have computer presence at every bedside. Our nurses, residents, and fellows are typing information into these stupid computers and not taking care of any patients. Um, and, well, they take care of patients when they can, but we really have burdened the humans with putting information into the computer, and the computer is not really connected to that patient. The computer is connected to whatever name was put into the computer by the nurse that put it in. Um, there have been isolated efforts, and if you Google or PubMed search for predicting ventilator changes and so forth, there are some fairly sophisticated ideas and implementations. But there are silo implementations that require significant computer investment at individual institutions, and nothing like I dreamed of in 1985. Well, what else is McPuff good for? Well, it was designed as a teaching tool, and it had to keep 15 teletype machines busy to make the medical students think that they were fully having the attention of the uh, computer. And I've translated this now into six different languages, the latter of which is called Swift. Uh, if you had a program like that, and we did, Randall and I had this at Hopkins, and I've had it in Utah, you can't really interrupt rounds and say, let's go down to my office and turn on the computer so that I can show you some isolated point. So for instance, if you hyperventilate somebody with pure oxygen for 10 minutes, or three minutes, let's say, how long can you leave them apneic? It's easy to illustrate with McPuff that you probably got five or 10 minutes if you really do that in a healthy person. And that's how you do um, you know, vocal cord surgery. But you really can't, but what if it's on everybody's phone? And this is a simulator of an iPhone, and I am developing McPuff on the phone. And this is a movie because I never want to try to do something live like this. Um, but this is on my phone, and hopefully someday I'll get it onto uh, other phones. But this is PO2, PCO2. It's a teletype output. I sort of like the teletype output. And I'm going to do what every medical student wants to do. I'm going to put it in. I'm going to put it in three percent oxygen. And that's the first thing anybody does with the simulation is they try to kill it. <laughs> and you'll see that it's going to scroll down, and uh, it shows the change from 21 to 3 percent. Continue the patient. You can see the O2 plunges, and I can inspect the categories and so forth of the of the thing. So this could run on a phone. Every single medical student in person could have downloaded this onto their, and then you could say, let's talk about the physiology. Now, if you have a phone, you need an app icon. And the first bullet here speaks for itself. Those of you that know me know that my fashion sense has been nil since I was born. Uh, but I needed an app uh, icon, and so I heard about stable diffusion. And I downloaded uh, B Diffusion, which is a program onto my computer, and I put in the prompt of heart and lung with a model that had been specifically trained to create iOS icons. And I generated about a dozen or two, and then I picked this one, and this is the icon that I used. And, um, so how does this work? And so this model's been trained with you know, samples of over five billion text image pairs. And it's now a specific file that a, you, know, you can take it and make it part of an application. And B Diffusion is one application that runs on my computer by itself. It's not hooked up to anything. You don't have to retrain it. It's been trained. It's, it's, it's a trained model. And the way this works is, I'm not going to get into this, but you've got basically two neural networks that are sort of going back and forth with each other. One's a generator, one's a discriminator. And at some point, they get good enough and they're done but it's remarkably efficient. And so I'm going to show you a result. When I type in the cue that I want a cute dog playing a violin, this was generated on my computer at home uh, in 37 seconds. And I'm going to do it faster than that in the name of time. But um, by grabbing this thing, if I can, here we go. And you'll see that it's generating. that. It did it in 25 iterations. 25 iterations is not very many iterations. And what's remarkable about it is this is random noise. So it's starting with random noise, and in 25 iterations, it's generating that. Uh, 
Here's a, here's a bunch of adorable dogs playing the cello. Here's Dr. Nurse Pick You. That's all I typed in, and I got these images. So why am I showing you these? Well, those two slides look pretty good. Um, but there are some problems, and when we get into later discussions about chat programs, I'm going to point out that it's harder to detect problems with chat programs than it is with images. So images are a good thing to play with because you can tell things. For instance, this dog's ear is screwed up. <laughs> and his paw isn't connected to an animal. This nurse has three fingers and her, and her stethoscope is broken. This nurse has her finger as part of a red tubing and there's a finger that's in the small circle that's not attached to a person. Uh, so there are deficits there. Well, so I'm writing this MacPuff thing for my iOS platform. And so I spend a lot of time when I learn a new language. Swift hasn't been a 45 year hobby, but MacPuff has been. So I watch a lot of YouTube and I go to Stack Overflow, which is a nerd haven for people that do coding. And I run into this, and this is how I heard about ChatGPT. Uh, basically, uh, Stack Overflow banned ChatGPT because there were wrong ChatGPT answers that looked right. And uh, so I was intrigued. Now I got to figure out what's going on with ChatGPT. Now, I have in this app, I want to be able to print out the results of a Mac app run. So I have to break up a PDF document and make it print correctly. And I don't really know how to break up a multi-page PDF document on an iPhone. So, but I clearly need to be able to find the nth instance of a substring in a string. So I type in, write me a function that will find that. And it gives me a Python function. Now, I wish I could have done this live for you. These are instantaneous. So this is like this isn't taking 10 minutes for it to think about. And it gives me this, and it says, here's how you use the function. Then I said, well, it actually has to be in Swift, and it has to work with Swift strings. And so instantly out this pops. And there's a little copy code button there, so you can paste it wherever you want to paste it. I said, well, how about in Fortran? So it wrote it in Fortran. And I also had it write it in COBOL, and I wrote it in several other languages, instantaneous. So you got to be intrigued. There's something compelling about this. Can you simulate oxygen transport in the lung? And it says, yes, I can. So I said, write a Fortran simulation of oxygen transport. And instantly it pops this out. Now it's very simple, and it, and it does type a nice disclaimer that this is really simplistic. But what's in the circle? The lung volume is five liters. Well, that's correct. Where did it get it from? Uh, alveolar surface area, 100 square meters, is actually approximately right. Some people would say 150 square meters, but it's approximately right. Uh, FiO2 is obvious. Blood flow rate is cardiac output, 5 liters per minute. So where did it find this out? I didn't tell it what parameters to put in. So you could look at this and say, this is really pretty good. The only problem is we don't consume 3 liters per minute of oxygen. So they're buried in the truth is complete falsehood, or what they would call a hallucination. And it explains how the damn thing works. Uh, I said, well, write it in Swift. And it made the same mistake about oxygen consumption. But otherwise, it just did this instantly. And it says, this code works in a similar way to the Fortran code provided in the previous answer. So this is the thing that I think is truly compelling about this. You're carrying on a conversation. And it's remembering the context of the conversation. And down below, as with the Fortran code. Then I said incorporate the dissociation curve. So it gives me a little bullshit about the Hill equation. And then I said, and it tells me how I could do it. And so then I said, put all the code in one file. And it combined them and gave me a simulation that incorporated the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Uh, what about a grant proposal? Let's write a grant. <laughs> write a grant proposal to evaluate the effect of anakinra on survival in patients with MODs in the pediatric ICU. That's half of the precise trial that we're doing. Immediately spits out this. It's got an introduction. It's not a full grant application, but it is damn close to a good outline. Uh, describes uh, the objectives, has a method section, expected outcomes, significance, budget that even includes the cost of the data coordinating center, and a conclusion. This is pretty much unbelievable. 
Then I said, can you provide details about the statistical analysis? And it gave me a sample size of 80 per group. Now, I ran this twice. Uh, two days earlier, it wanted 200 per group. So there's some uncertainty in how it's doing its power calculations here. But the statistics are not really wrong. They might not be sophisticated, but they're not really wrong. Then I said, how do you decide 80 patients? And then it says, well, blah, blah, blah. And you'll see there's no numbers on this. And so this is like you have that young student or fellow who doesn't know the answer to your question, and they can talk a lot about <laughs> anything except the answer. And I've seen a tweet that says, chat GPT is the best bullshitter on the planet. So, um, well, maybe you could write my talk. So how would a clinical decision support uh, tool manage a PICU with mods? And it gives me this stuff. Then I said, how about neural networks? Would they be useful? And it says, well, yeah, they could be useful. It puts them under predictive modeling. What kinds of neural networks might be useful? And the, the data people that are in the front table recognize that uh, they've written papers here at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles on all of these except the GAN. And the GAN is the one that I used for the imaging. But there are papers, and I have actually plugged all the way through them. They're almost incomprehensible for somebody like me to read, but they're, they're fascinating. So you've got these things called RNNs and LSTMs and GANs, and there's convolutional networks that I didn't circle. Then I said, well, what about data from the virtual PICU system? It says data from a virtual PICU system potentially could be used to train neural networks. And it mentions RNNs because that's the way that continuous outcomes are going to be predicted. Uh, but then I said, I actually meant this one. And so then it talks to me about this one. And then it says, you know, you could use this to train RNNs to predict outcomes such as patient mortality. That's actually the title of one of your papers. Um, then uh, tell me more about this. They developed at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And then down below it says, it's then transmitted to a central server where it can be accessed by physicians remotely, allowing them to monitor patients and make treatments in real time. And one of the main advantages of the VPS <laughs> is that it allows remote monitoring, which can be especially beneficial for patients who are located in rural and underserved areas. <laughs> it's making this shit up. <laughs> this. There's, and when you read the literature about this, there's, there's terms for this. I've read some of the papers written by OpenAI, I mean, the, uh, yeah, the OpenAI company. They call these hallucinations. So ChatGPT was trained to predict the next word that would be encountered on the internet. And so that's where it came from, uh, sweeping the internet for the last 20 years up to, to, to 2021. 20, but this is complete confabulation, and this is the problem uh, what are our students going to do? So here, I, and I got inspired to, to do this because I went on YouTube and I searched ChatGPT in medicine and found residents and fellows and medical students who had made YouTube videos about how ChatGPT could be used. Uh, and this is uh, what I typed in. Write a consult on a patient uh, with respiratory failure from RSV on a ventilator with IMV23, PIP30, PEEP8, and FIO280, hemodynamically unstable on epinephrine. And it pumps out a really nice paragraph here, except it's got me on an inspiratory to expiratory ratio of 23. <laughs> so then I said IMV means intermittent mandatory ventilation. And then it says, it says thank you for the clarification. And it rewrites it, and then it even in this big circle explains what IMV is. And actually, it, be it better understands IMV than the respiratory therapist did <laughs> in Utah when I moved to Utah, because I was the first intensivist there. They did not understand what IMV is. And apparently, ChatGPT sort of does know how to express what IMV does. I gave some blood gas results and what would be appropriate, and basically it says increase the ventilator settings because you got respiratory acidosis, and that's correct. Then I said it made the blood pressure drop, and I upped the epi, and that didn't help. And basically it gives a list of things that are exactly right. Uh, look for other things, maybe take the tidal volume down. At the bottom, administer fluids for the underlying hypovolemia that we know that all patients suffer from. We used to have on the back of our ties at Hopkins volume. Now, something I forgot to tell you. The SWIFT program to find the nth instance of a substring in a string didn't work, but it looked damn good. Had an explanation for how to use it, 
how it worked, but it didn't work because strings are not single characters like they used to be in the ASCII days. They're very complex clumps of multiple characters and the assumption that it made was that it was like an old C string. Now, what if you want to run ChatGPT locally and this is sort of fun to look at because this is basically what the equivalent is that you need, 10,000 GPUs and a 300,000 CPUs and a billion dollars, which is what Microsoft initially kicked in with this company and they've now kicked in 10 billion more dollars. It required 3,640 petaflops per second day. So I was sort of intrigued by that term. Um, but this is how people are quantifying compute requirements. And there's no computer that does this. That's why you need 100,000 computers. But that's 10 to the 20th flops per day. And I needed 3,640 of 10 to the 20th flops per day. Uh, that's not happening on our laptops. But they did point out in the uh, Instruct GPT, which is another app, that you can use reinforcement from human feedback. So humans can look at the output from a computer and rank them. And then when you're training a neural network, you always have a loss function. It's, you could consider it a gain function if you think of it backwards. And they use the human feedback as one of the rewards. And that's how they got ChatGPT to the level where humans really like interacting with it. And this doesn't take anywhere near that much uh, stuff. Well, we don't have that kind of money, but I think the point is once you've got a model trained, you can that's a checkpoint, and you can say, I've got this model, I'm gonna load it somewhere. Now, you can't run ChatGPT's model on your laptop. Um, but you could further train it in specific domains. Now, what is it that makes AI compelling? I had a slide on ELIZA that I was gonna put in here, but I left it out. ELIZA was written in 1961, and it was a Rogerian dialogue that just repeated back to the person what they typed in. Um, the guy who wrote it was writing it to show that machine-human interaction is shallow, but his assistant actually thought that Eliza was sentient, uh, just because the ability to carry on a conversation was that way. Now, all of the neural networks that I've discussed, uh, this, the people in this room that are data scientists have done enormous amounts of work in this area. Uh, and as I said, I'm. Uh, plugging through those papers, and I consumed all of my compute units on uh, Colab, so, uh, but something is compelling about this whole thing. ChatGPT was released on November 20 or 30th, and one million users in five days, the fastest uptake of any computer program in history, and there are 100 million users today after 10 weeks. Um, something is making people really be intrigued. And, and two days ago, or now it might be three days ago, Microsoft announced that Bing is going to have the, the underlying technology of this built into it. I think this changes our agenda because I think it makes it urgent for us to figure out how we're going to get on this boat because if we don't, the problem is that people are going to believe it. Now, think about deep learning research. You know, an RNN monitoring for continuous risk assessment in a PICU is a fascinating paper to read it's not gonna be compelling for our clinicians. They're just gonna think it's another annoying trigger on the EHR. Um, but if they could talk to a program and discuss the risk of a specific patient with some kind of a model that was fine-tuned on highly accurate, well-curated PICU data, it would be compelling. And the ability to explain is also part of that compelling aspect. And again, there's a paper from the group here that looks at masking what went into the neural network and identifying what are the factors that probably explain the decision of the neural net to give it. So I think our challenge is to how do we get something like this that would be useful in the PICU? So what do we need? Well, we need, we need to have people that are well-trained and I've always thought it's easier to teach a physician computer programming than it is to, to, to teach a computer program or medicine. I think that's probably true in data science. And I think that we really need to get young people in our field to be interested in data science like they might be interested in the PhD in basic science so that we've got people that are gonna be able to make the translation not from the bench to the bedside, but from the informatics to the bedside. Uh, 
And then we need high quality clinical data on millions of patients. Well, we got millions of patients. I think you're probably approaching two million patients in the vPICU. The next step is to incorporate all of the EHR data, height, fidelity, waveforms, all the rest of this, and that's part of the agenda, I think, of the PDC, which I never heard of until four weeks ago, so I'm just guessing. Should we be talking to some of these companies about we've got a unique resource and we've got the humans that can do the reinforcement learning to make this maybe affordable, and then should we consider creating reasonable data sets that could be used by ourselves or youngsters or in competitions to make people interested in this? For instance, like Mimic 4. Uh, now, here's an example. I thought a long time ago computers would do the simulations. Well, why not train a, a network with trios of data? We got an initial blood gas. I make a discrete change on the ventilator. I've got an after blood gas. Um, it's not really gonna be the next app that's gonna sell millions of dollars, but that's probably a pretty good exercise if people wanted to learn about neural networks and things like that. And you got a couple million of these trios already lying around, so it's just there. And if you think about it, that's how we all learned to run ventilators. We saw a blood gas, we made a change, we got another blood gas, and we did that a few hundred times and a few thousand times, and our neural network was trained. I mean, that's where they came up with neural networks from our brains. So Mimic is an example. If you go on Mimic, it has six components in the current rendition. The X-ray one has 377,000 images on it. And you can get ac access to it by signing a data use agreement. So we could be doing something similar to that uh, to really incite people, many people, to look at this. And if you look on things like Colab or, or uh, different uh, machine learning sites, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that are playing with this. And I think we should have some people playing with medical data. And I don't think maybe high school students should be playing with it, but we should have access to this. So these are my rash conclusions. I think we need to be very audacious and ambitious in the next two days as we discuss things. I think that Randall and his colleagues and Tom and all the others that were there were right that data aggregation is really the key. And in 1997, they had no idea what they were gonna do with the data. Um, but there is a caution, which is we can't throw away our expert knowledge and I'm worried about our youngsters because they're gonna believe a computer. My wife believes anything on the internet. 90% of the public probably believes anything on the internet and when a medical student reads that simulation that I showed you and has no clue that we don't consume three liters of oxygen per minute, they're not gonna recognize the errors. And so I think we're on the advent of an exciting future, but I think we have to do this now. Because we can't afford to sit back for two or three years and see, well, what do these things do? And I would say that before November 30th, we might have been talking about, this is gonna take a couple of years before we jump on. We'll keep on doing you know, RNN research and we'll, and we'll finesse the models a little bit more and get some bigger training sets. I think it's urgent that we do this as expeditiously as possible because the world's gonna have these things out there and people are gonna start using them. Now this is, <laughs> this is my final slide. This is what happens when you tell stable diffusion you give it a photograph, I gave it the photograph on the middle bottom, and then I said, oil painting by Van Gogh. <laughs> and it always puts a random, numbers, a random number into this to, for the initial noise. So it started with the noise just like that dog with the violin, and it had the image to be targeting, and it came up with these, and so, this is my final slide and I will stop here and people have any questions, I think we might have a minute or two, but thank you for your attention. Or who wants to look at my book? <laughs> Thank you.
like, yeah, it's the interesting thing about chat GPT and Bing. One of the real problems with chat GPT is a common exist is that you find out that the one so thing and you know I do where it gets its stuff from. If I read, you know, all I know is what we're doing at the other time. If I read that, that Yeah, the question was the chat GBT is not connected actually to the internet. It's just a discrete model and it's not connected to PubMed. It does say the investigators at Children's Hospital Los Angeles have trained a recurrent network. But if I ask who are the authors, it says I'm not connected to the, to the internet. So it heard about it by sweeping text. But Bing is supposed to have a connection to the internet that's live and PubMed. And it's not ChatGPT. Microsoft has been using the model to come up with this product. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens. How many people have used, actually logged in and used ChatGPT in this room? <laughs> all right, so more than half have not. And that's, all of you have heard of it, but I think log into this so you can see what it's doing. It's, it's changes. <laughs>